Hello, everybody. Okay, well, of course, uh, today the Health Minister and I are out and about, of course, talking about the Queensland he Health and Hospitals Plan with extra money going into the PA hospital here. Uh, there will be a major $350 million expansion for 249 more beds here. They'll be online by late 2026 and we're actually uh, on the site behind us here where the extra beds will be built. So this is great news. Of course, we know that um, we, we are investing over $9 billion on capital infrastructure right throughout the state. The ministers have been out and about across Queensland. And of course, the South East is of course benefiting as well with the extra beds. Uh, today we're joined by the Chief Health Officer as well because uh, we want to talk about uh, some rising uh, COVID cases, but also to um, rising uh, flu cases and some precautions that our elderly people, our seniors can take, um, especially as we lead up to the peak around late July, early August. Uh, so at the moment, uh, we have more than 2,000 staff that are currently um, on leave, whether it's due to flu or due to COVID. Uh, there are 705 people in hospital, uh, that is 599 in public and 106 in private. And in relation to the flu, we have 105 cases of people with the flu in uh, public hospitals, five in ICU. Now, uh, one uh, positive is the fact that we now have 710,000 people, since we announced the free flu jabs, have gone and had their flu vaccination, which is fantastic news, well done there. And of course, uh, people can still go and get that free flu vaccination up until the 17th of July. And now 37% of our population has had the flu vaccine, which is great news. I really want to thank Queenslanders for going out and getting their flu shots. So I'll hand over to uh, the Health Minister. Uh, then our Chief Health Officer will talk to you about those specific uh, issues, especially for our seniors in our population there, and also encouraging people to get their boosters, especially if they have not had their boosters, as we get as we lead into this peak of, uh, of, of winter. And then we're happy to take some questions after that. So I'll hand over to the Health Minister first. Uh, thank you, Premier. And it is great to be here today at the Princess Alexandra Hospital talking about the Palaszczuk government's investment in new beds and expansion of services. Uh, $355.8 million will be going into the PA hospital to expand its bed capacity by 257 beds. Eight of those will be uh, extra beds as part of the refurbishment of the renal unit and they will come online in the second half of 2023 with the remaining 249 beds as part of the expansion and refurbishment of the hospital which will include uh, extending the building just behind us here uh, for 249 extra hospital beds uh, which we know is certainly going to be needed. Uh, the Premier has talked about the pressures on the health system that we continue to see. I saw Dr Bruce Willett coming out yesterday talking about the pressures on our GPs and he, in his over 30 years of experience as a GP he has never seen this sort of pressure on our general practitioners and pressure on our general practitioners means pressure on our hospital system. Today we have 2016 staff that are furloughed because of COVID alone. And then we have additional staff off because of influenza and other illnesses. So we are seeing an escalation of the number of staff uh, that are unavailable to work because of COVID. In addition, across the public and private hospital system, today we have 705 COVID patients in hospital beds. Uh, that includes 106 in our private hospitals. That's the highest number of COVID patients we have seen in our private hospitals since the start of the Omicron wave at the start of this year. So uh, we are watching this closely. Uh, we have surpassed the total number of COVID patients we had at our peak in hospitalisation in the second wave. And we are progressing towards that peak in uh, the first wave that we saw at the start of the year. 
So we know that's putting pressure on our hospital systems uh, and we do emphasise to people uh, that they need to be coming out and getting their vaccinations. Uh, I know that uh, people have come out and made sure that they've got their first and second COVID jabs. That's fantastic, but that's not enough. We need people coming forward who is eligible for their third booster. Uh, we have uh, only 63% of the eligible population have had their third booster and less than 50% have had their fourth booster. And the Chief Health Officer, Dr John Gerard, will talk about those boosters uh, in a bit more depth in a moment. Uh, but that's why the investment we're doing now, the work we're doing, the work we have done across our hospital system is so important. These are unprecedented times and we need to continue to be investing in our public hospitals and building those capacities are now and into the future to manage COVID, but also the general growth in demand across the hospital system. I'll now ask Dr. Jarrad to say a few words. Uh, I will follow up. Uh, I do have uh, the flu numbers. Just give me. Uh, so the 2016, sorry, is combined. We have 1,716. Sorry, I'll have to get back to you on the staff numbers. So the 2016 is just staff isolating and quarantining because of COVID, uh, but I'll come back to you with uh, the number of staff that are off for, for the flu as well. Thanks. Okay, Dr. Gerard, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Minister and Premier. The third COVID pandemic wave due to the BA4 and BA5 sub-variants is now well established in Queensland. Hospitals are feeling the strain with over 700 uh, COVID inpatients across the public and private sector. And in addition to that, there's another 100 plus uh, influenza patients in our public hospitals as well. This, the number of public hospital uh, COVID inpatients has risen by 140%, 140% over the last month. And this is due to the BA4 and 5 sub-variants, which are now dominant in Queensland. I'm afraid current modelling indicates that the wave is going to get worse at least until the end of July, if not, if not even after that. So the peak of the current wave is currently projected, based on our most recent modelling, uh, to uh, continue to... to to get worse until, at least until the end of July or early August when it will peak um, or even later than that. So that will put even greater pressure on our, on our hospitals in the coming weeks. Uh, this uh, sub-variant can evade immunity whether that be acquired through vaccination or natural infection. So there is a very good chance that either you or someone you know uh, will be infected with this sub-variant in the coming weeks. It's very likely that either you or someone you know close to you will be infected. It will be very common. Uh, it's so my message is it's important to, for you to prepare now. So I'll say that again. It is important for you to prepare now. The good news is that up-to-date vaccination will protect you against severe disease and hospitalisation. Up-to-date vaccination will protect you against severe disease and hospitalisation. And if you're up-to-date, the illness that you will get with this virus is likely to be mild. Um, but unfortunately, at this stage, people over the age of 65 who are most likely to be admitted with this disease in Queensland, only or just under 50% are up-to-date with their vaccinations, which is very disturbing. The vast majority of people currently in our hospitals with COVID-19 are over the age of 65 and are not up to date with their vaccination. So I'm concerned that this message is not getting through, that people over the age of 65 need to, need to be up to date. So I implore you, there are two things you can do to prepare yourself today. Ask yourself, are you up to date with vaccination? So over the age of 65, that's four doses. Uh, if you're an adult under the age of 65, that's three doses. That may change based on any on ATAGI recommendations, and I know ATAGI is reviewing uh, the guidelines today, and we're just waiting with interest to see whether they expand the recommendation for those fourth doses. Um, 
if you are the other thing that I think is not well understood and the message has not got out as well as I would have liked is that if you are over the age of 65 and you have other medical conditions you may well be eligible to get one of the two medicines which are currently available to treat um, COVID-19 um, and uh, we know they risk your chance of being admitted to hospital. So we ask, uh, I would strongly suggest that if you are over the age of 65 and you have medical conditions, you work out now, you in advance, before you get COVID-19, whether you will be eligible to get these new medications, um, which are widely available now in, in, the, in Queensland. They're easily available, there's good supplies. Uh, work out in advance whether you'll be eligible when they come. And there are some complex criteria over the age of 65 and other medical conditions. Now, we will not uh, be implementing uh, public health mandates, uh, such as a mandate, mandating mask wearing, but older people and the immunosuppressed should seriously consider uh, wearing a mask in crowded uh, public places at least until the end of August, because we believe this wave will continue at least until then. Thank you very much. I do not believe we'll be heading back towards mask mandates. These waves are likely to continue uh, off and on every few months for some time to come. It could be years. And if we keep implementing legal mandates every three months and then withdrawing them, I think that's, that is just divisive and it's not helpful. And I think people will not follow them. So I, so I, I am not, not at all in favour of mask mandates at this stage. Yeah. I, oh, cer certainly. If, oh, if people watch, certainly, people should feel free to wear masks. Absolutely, uh, and I, but I'm I specifically mention older people and the immunosuppressed because they're the most likely uh, to be get severe disease and be hospitalised. But certainly, there are many reasons why someone would not want to get this this, this infection at the moment. So anyone should feel free to wear a mask. Definitely. Uh, we expect that it will be at least as. Uh, bad as the first wave in January. So up towards, at this stage, and we, it's only early days around the thousand mark, but it's early days and there are different models. So we, we think it will at least, the peak will be at, at least um, at its earliest at the end of this month. There are some models that suggest it might even go longer. I'm sorry, did I just hear the question? Well, I think the, the, where we are at the moment, it's, it's about personal responsibility. The, the, the future is not public health measures and public health mandates. It's personal responsibility. There is a lot that individuals can do to prepare themselves. I mean, if you, get, if you are up to date with your vaccination, it's very unlikely you will get seriously ill and end up in hospital. So the, the key here is personal responsibility. And people should now be thinking about preparing themselves for this wave as it gets worse over the next few weeks, because it is very likely that someone in your environment will, get, will be infected with this virus. If you are up to date with your vaccinations, you are unlikely to require admission to hospital, even if you are over 65. That's correct. Just, un, just under 50% of Queenslanders over the age of 65 have received the fourth dose of the vaccine, which, is, which means the message isn't getting through, and I'm concerned about that, particularly as we're heading towards this peak of the BA45 subvariant wave. No, it's the nature of this particular strand of the virus, which is evading both natural immunity and vaccine-induced immunity. So that's why there will be such a, we project there will be such a large number of patients infected. And that's, this, it's not unique, I mean, I'm sure you're aware, this is not unique to Queensland. This is happening simultaneously uh, around the world. And one of the issues we have in terms of our modelling is we have no one to, no other uh, country to compare with because it's happening simultaneously in all countries. It's happening across Europe, United Kingdom, North America. So we have no one to, to compare with as to what the projections will be look like. But but our modelers, we've had, we have a number of different models, but it's least, we won't reach our peak at least until the end of this month. It's not, it's a good question. I think we, the jury is out. 
There is some laboratory data which suggests that these subvariants are more likely to infect lung, lung tissue. But in terms of uh, the real world experience in people, we don't have enough information to make that comment about whether these subvariants are more severe. Probably, probably not. Probably not. And if you're, again, I'm going to say it again, if you're, if you're up to date with your vaccination, the disease is likely to be mild. I think those processes are already happening. So private hosp the private hospitals are already uh, involved in the uh, response. Oh, almost certainly. Uh, we we will have to do this. Is this is a, 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 a uh, we have never experienced anything like this um, to have such a large number of beds occupied in a pandemic on top of influenza. This is this is not happened in my lifetime. I don't have the data here. Sorry. I mean, the hospitals have measures. The hospitals will cope. Uh, they, they, they will know what to do. It, but it will be a pressure. It, there will be pressure on them. There's no way. There's no. There's no way around this. Well, they're getting to hospital. Most of the people in hospital, and I, I must state this, are, are older and they're not, they're not up to date with their vaccinations, but they're coming to hospital by the normal route. So the, the emergency departments are still functioning. I mean, there are, you know, there are some delays, of course, but things are still functioning. Um, but we expect there will be increasing demand in the next few weeks. I... Uh, no, I don't, I, don't, I don't believe that will be necessary. Um, we're probably at the peak of the influenza epidemic. Um, whether it will... It's a very unusual year. It is a, it is, it's very early in the year to have an influenza peak. Uh, our numbers in influenza aren't growing at this stage. We, see we have about 100 in hospital. We're not exactly sure how we'll go, long it will go after this. But, I mean, if people have had ample opportunity to get vaccinated against influenza. They've had ample opportunity. I, I, my focus now is on these boosters for, pa for patients against COVID. That's the critical thing at the moment. Um, that process is ongoing, as I understand. I, um, I don't. Uh, I'm not directly involved in that process. Uh, as, uh, as you know, is the normal uh, process as far as DGs and ministers. So I understand the process is ongoing, and at the moment we've got an acting director general, and we're just getting on with the job. So. No, I don't have because uh, that'll up, be up to the panel as to when they come back with recommendations. Um, well, what I saw from uh, the Courier Mail's poll is over 50% of people realise that uh, uh, the pressures are being caused by underfunding of aged care and disability and also access to GPs. Uh, that was in the Courier Mail's poll. So the public, the public actually understand that the, uh, there are factors that are putting pressure on our public hospital system that is outside the control of the Queensland Government. Uh, that is primary and allied health care. It's support for aged care and disability. Uh, and we are working with the Commonwealth on these issues. And as I say, Dr Bruce Willett came out yesterday saying that they have never seen these sort of pressures on general practice before. This is unprecedented. And if people can't get in to see GPs, then they turn to our public hospital system. And that's why we are seeing so much demand uh, on our EDs and we're seeing increased chronic illness and more complex cases. So, you know, we have proven that since 2015, we have got on with investing in both expanding our workforce and expanding our beds. 1,350 extra beds already put on, more beds in the pipeline, and another 2,509 beds out of this budget over the next six years. So certainly no one, um, you know, the, the opposition might make claims, but... I'm pretty sure the op opposition weren't saying uh, back in 2015, why aren't you planning for a global health pandemic? No one could have predicted that this would happen. We, we generally look at around 1,200 beds on any given day 
being available for planned care. Now, 600 of those beds are being taken up right now with COVID. Over 500 of those beds are being taken up with long stays around disability and aged care. That's almost all of our planned care beds being taken up by two things that are outside of our control, but we are getting on with investing in extra staff and hospital beds. Uh, and we have done that since the day we got elected. And this budget builds on that uh, in the most extensive way that this state has ever seen. Look, we had a very, very productive meeting uh, with all health ministers across the country last Friday in Canberra. Um, the Commonwealth understands the pressures that we're facing. We welcome the fact that National Cabinet and First Ministers agreed to a view uh, the pressures on the health system. Uh, this is something that everyone knows we need to work together on. There is commitment to work together on a health workforce and strategies going forward uh, and also getting people out of long stay beds with disability and aged care. We achieved more in 24 hours when the a National Cabinet met and the disabilities met than we've been able to do in nine years under the previous Morrison government. So I'm very optimistic in being able to work through the issues and deal with the pressures, uh, including you know working with our GPs as well. Um, Jack, you also mentioned how many deaths for influenza. There's been 40 deaths so far since January from influenza in Queensland. Oh, significantly higher. We know it is significantly higher. Um, I find, as I've, sa I've said previously, I find the most useful measure as to what's really happening is the number of hospitalisations because that's something that does not uh, depend on people getting a test or registering it. So the hospitalisation data is the most useful information for tracking how this uh, pandemic is going. And yes, we know it's substantially higher than the number that are actually being reported. Well, that gives us a, a rough idea. <laughs> Well, again, that will be up to each health service to deal with. I mean, we, if they're sick, they're sick. We can, sick people cannot uh, come to work if they've got COVID-19. Um, and this is, what, this is what the bread and butter of clinicians, they, this is what they do on a, on a daily basis. And I, I'm afraid it's going to be a lot of stress on our clinical staff in hospitals for the next few weeks. Let me make it clear, every member of my team, and I'll make it very clear to them, understands how important that review is and how that review will mean that Queensland will have the most transparent uh, government in the nation. Why do you think that message isn't getting through to Dr. Well, I'm happy to talk to him personally. I haven't seen the post, but I'll have a look at that, yep. Um, can I just recap from what the uh, Chief Health Officer was saying? So if you're over 65, I'm urging our seniors in our community to wear a mask uh, when you are in public areas, uh, especially over the next uh, four weeks as we go into this wave of COVID and influenza. Thank you for getting vaccinated. If you have not had your fourth booster, please go and do so. And as you can see, the numbers are increasing. We expect those numbers to increase even further over the coming weeks. Now, I also want to make some uh, comments in relation to the Triple C report that was handed down the other day. Uh, can I say that the Leader of the Opposition must apologise to the people of Queensland? For five months, myself, my government, my staff were subjected to horrendous attacks from the Opposition, uh, claiming all sorts of nonsense uh, that was clearly found to not be the truth. Now, if you're a leader of the opposition, you have to stand up and be accountable for your actions. And not only was it the leader of the opposition, it was Jared Blay and Fiona Simpson. Now, day after day, and if you go back and look through the press conferences, I'm sure that there were over 10 press conferences where they got up and alleged all of these issues that are now proven not to have happened. Now, the decent thing to do, if he has any inch of integrity, is to stand up and apologise to the people of Queensland. For five months, for five months, I stood strong and I said that we will await the processes of the Triple C. And the Triple C report was handed down the other day. 
and for five months uh, there was horrendous allegations alleged at the integrity of my government which was found to be not true and I will not stand for this. So today is the day for the Leader of the Opposition to come forward and to apologise to the people of Queensland for the, the allegations, uh, the hysterical allegations that were made over many, many days and many, many months. Well, Cole Drake has also made uh, recommendations in relation to that, and 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 there will be the uh, required staff. But um, you were there um, when day after day um, that stories were run, which were uh, based on what the opposition was saying, and it has been found to be baseless in fact and baseless in truth. And it was found not to be true. It was all investigated by the Triple C, and the report is in black and white. And the report says uh, very, very clearly that none of those allegations happened. And the opposition got up day in, day out, and most of you were witness to that over those uh, numerous days, and numerous weeks, and numerous months. And we stood strong, waited for the processes. To, to go through its natural course and that report was tabled. Absolutely. Absolutely. Ab no, absolutely. Go back and look at all those press conferences that what they said was factually incorrect and they got up day in and day out and made these allegations. Uh, as I said, the Coldrake report will ensure that the new integrity office officer will have uh, the required staff. Um, but as I said, every single day they got up, they got up, they used uh, words, hysterical words, made allegations against personal allegations against me, personal allegations against my staff, personal allegations against the department were found to be not true. Today is the day for David Crisofulli to apologise to Queenslanders for the gross misrepresentation uh, that he has made in relation uh, to those, to those um, allegations. Premier, you said the other day you intended to leave um, your team to the Tories probably more or less. Yes. Do you have any preference on who could leave your team when you step down from, from that role? No. Why? You don't know one, no one in the Cabinet you think is doing a good job? I know where you're going with this. I'm very happy leading the government and the people of Queensland will make up their minds uh, when we go to the next election. I think everybody in my team is doing an excellent job. OK? Thank you. Oh, sorry, but one thing I forgot to add. Sorry if I can just before I go to you. Um, look, I've also... Um, our heart goes out to uh, what's happening down in New South Wales and uh, I've conveyed to the New South Wales uh, Premier that any uh, requests for assistance that Queensland can provide uh, that we're more than happy uh, to help out. Uh, I think that's a matter for the for the lawyers. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>